In this module, we're going to discuss Roman art and architecture itself, a very large topic. Thus, this lecture will be divided into two portions. Part one will address key themes in Roman architecture, and part two will discuss Roman art. Roman architecture in and of itself, of course, is an enormous topic that represents a lot of uh, themes that are important. So I want to highlight here some key ones that we should be aware of. First is the contrast between private and public architecture. Within the corpus of Roman architectural forms, we see a clear differentiation between architectural types that are designated for private use as opposed to those that are intended for public use. Building types develop along these lines. We shall see in this set of images a number of examples from both spheres. The private represented by domestic architecture, notably private houses and also apartment buildings, and public architecture, architecture that is designed for public use in various ways, ranging from honorific monuments to civil buildings. Within both private and public spaces, the Romans observe a strict internal division of space, with space designated for certain use, often along privileged lines of sight or privileged areas. In many cases, it's important to think about architecture as a form of ideology. The Romans craft a careful visual language that allows them to use monumental art and architecture, especially architectural sculpture, as a way to present clear ideological messages in support of larger uh, idea campaigns and political regimes. <clears throat> Form and function often enter into discussions of architecture in any period, and it's important to think along these lines in terms of how uh, uh, one aspect determines the other, that is, does the form of a building indicate its function or use? In some cases, this is quite clear in the Roman world, as we will see with the Republican townhouse, the so-called Domus. An important historical figure and writer to be aware of when thinking about Roman architecture is the writer Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, often just referred to now as Vitruvius, who lived from around 80 BC until sometime after 15 BC, Vitruvius, an engineer uh, principally in his training, is known mostly for writing a 10-book treatise on architecture, the De Architectura, in the first century BC, in which he presents not only important technical details about Roman architecture, but many important concepts, the philosophy of Roman building and Roman architecture as well. And Vitruvius uh, is not only a source for us, but was an important inspiration in the European Renaissance. As you can see, the drawing uh, at the right uh, uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, so-called Vitruvian Man. Da Vinci made a careful study of Vitruvius's text himself. Let's start by talking about the first category, private architecture, domestic architecture. We can see a breakdown in terms of types of domestic buildings, really three categories. So let's go through them. The first, the domus, domus in Latin meaning house. Uh, this is a townhouse. Many of these are of the so-called atrium type in the Republican and early imperial periods. And um, later Roman houses will develop in such a way that they mostly lose the atrium later on. The villa, a house that is explicitly not in the city, thus found in the countryside, or at the seashore can mean a productive house, a farmhouse, or a house associated with, with industry. It can also mean a luxury retreat for elite persons uh, looking to get out of the city. Insula, the Latin word for island, also used here to indicate a multi-story apartment building in Roman cities, and we will see an example. The social history of the Roman house in and of itself is very important, which brings us back to the form and function uh, uh, concept. The patron-client system, as we have read, is operative in the Republican and imperial, early imperial periods, whereby 
patrons provide political, financial, and social support for their clients, the house becomes the center of the patron-client system as it is in the atrium of the domus that the patron would receive his clientage. In the world of the family, the private aspect of the house, the house is the center of the familia, the family, and the area where the head of family, the pater familias, exercises his patria potestas. The familia, of course, includes not just the biological family, but the extended family group that also includes any slaves owned by the household. Here, a generic diagram of the domus, the atrium type house. Now, I should point out that even though this is a standard generic plan, no two domas look the same. There's a lot of variation, but this gives us a general idea of the key parts. You will notice an elongated ground plan with two uh, 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 main internal divisions, as we will see, entry from the street through a narrow doorway into the so-called atrium, there at number five on this diagram, and in the back of the building, the area centered around the peristyle, number 14 on this drawing. The domus is internally divided into two parts, the pars urbana and the pars rustica. Pars urbana, large number one, pars uh, rustica, large number two. Pars urbana, meaning the sophisticated or urbane part of the house, Pars rustica, the rustic part of the house. You will notice on the generic diagram that there is a strong visual axis moving through those two parts, starting from the doorway at the street, continuing through the atrium, all the way through the peristyle, through the dining room at number nine there. We see three main rooms that we should be aware of. The atrium, the center of the pars urbana, the main reception hall of the house, where the pater familias would receive his clients, the tablinum, the office or study of the pater familias, and the peristyle, a sort of garden courtyard that is the center of the private part of the house, onto which the dining room, number nine, and other service rooms like the kitchen communicate. So we see strict division, clients, only make it as far as the atrium. Friends, family members, make it all the way through the house to the peristyle. The Roman townhouse uh, utilizes an unusual uh, 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 arrangement for uh, admitting light and air into the house in that the atrium has an opening in the roof, most often. Uh, that's called the compluvium, and a corresponding pool to capture any rainwater, the impluvium. Uh, otherwise, this room would be very dark, as it does not have any windows. Um, the impluvium compluvium arrangement allows for light and air, and you get the added benefit of this water collected in a tank underneath the impluvium for household use. No two domas are alike. An example of a famous house at Pompeii, the city destroyed by Mount Vesuvius in 1879, is the house of the Vetii. You can see on here a sort of a uh, a messy ground plan compared to our generic drawing with two atria, two atriums, a large peristyle, dining rooms communicating onto there. Um, so a lot of variation in these ground plans. Pompeii provides great evidence, of course, owing to its um, catastrophic destruction for domestic architecture and is a primary source for uh, our information about domestic architecture in the Roman world. Oftentimes, uh, domestic spaces are brilliantly decorated. This, the bedroom, the cubiculum, from the villa of Publius Fanius Sinistor at Poscuriale, um, also destroyed in AD 79 uh, by the eruption of Vesuvius. You can see the brightly colored wall painting, the window grate still in place there. Um, a lot of these colors and uh, color schemes often seem a little bit loud, a little bit garish to modern tastes. Uh, this is very high fashion uh, wall decoration for the first century BC. Another shot of the same room. You can see its mosaic floor in place. The fantastical wall painting providing sort of fantastic imaginary scenes of architecture. 
playing with perspective, um, really a tour de force of Roman painting. If you want to see more um, information, more pictures of um, Roman domestic architecture, I point you to these two excellent sites, Pompeian Pictures and Pompeian, House Pompeian Households, uh, an online companion. Not every Roman could afford to live in a private townhouse. Some uh, Romans uh, lived in uh, apartment housing, not too dissimilar in concept from apartment housing today. And the concept uh, 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 of apartment housing is informed by a shortage of space. Space gets expensive uh, during population booms in Rome and especially in the port city of Ostia at the mouth of the Tiber River, uh, most notably in the second century AD. So the solution is to build upwards, stacking buildings sometimes as many as five stories tall uh, with uh, uh, flats. Um, these could be uh, fairly luxurious or fairly squalid. Um, and you can see a reconstruction of an insula here, shops at the street level, apartments on upper floors. Um, um, and since property became very valuable in second century Ostia, we see a lot of these insulae uh, growing up as a solution to the shortage of housing. Public architecture the complement to the private realm. Public architecture uh, in the Roman world is very important. It creates public spaces, obviously. It also allows for the communication of messages to the populace. A lot of the architecture in the public sphere is show architecture. It may not have an explicit utilitarian function, but it has an ideological function. For example, the Temple of uh, Mars Ultor, located in the Forum of Augustus, completed in 2 BC, is an example of a public architectural space. A forum is a public square for the conduct of civic and sacred, and sometimes also judicial business. The Forum of Augustus was vowed by Augustus, who pledged to the gods that he would avenge his murdered adopted father, Julius Caesar, and the completion of this temple uh, represented the completion of his vow made to Mars. Mars Ultor meaning the Avenger. So the form of Augustus is a, a, a space, here you see the reconstruction drawing, a space for uh, uh, utilitarian use, but also for displaying messages. And as we've read, um, a great campaign of sculpture and inscriptions communicated messages to the viewers about Augustus and his legitimacy as um, a Roman ruler, his place in a long line of great Roman statesmen. The Forum today is uh, in a ruined state, but nonetheless we can still get the sense of this as uh, um, uh, an important and also opulent space. Examples like the Ara Pacis Augustae, the Augustan Altar of Peace, dedicated in 9 BC, provide us another example of public architecture this functional in the sense that the altar inside of the enclosure here at the center is used for state level sacrifice of the state religion, but also provides an opportunity for advertising messages. The Arapakis is decorated on its exterior with relief sculpture, as you can see, and this relief sculpture tells more stories, completely in pictorial form, of Augustus and his family, why they are legitimate leaders and how they have restored peace to the Roman state. And you see Romans here, members of the uh, household of Augustus, set to participate in a um, religious ritual. Mythological scenes accompany these scenes of procession. Here, um, a scene showing us the abundance, the fertility of the land, um, uh, another circumstance that Augustus has guaranteed by returning peace to the Roman Empire. Another important civic architecture form, public architecture form, is the basilica, a building more or less innovated by the Romans. You see a later example here of the early fourth century, uh, known sometimes called the Basilica of Constantine. Um, the basilica is a multi-purpose space that can be used for mercantile functions as well as for the meeting of law courts. The Basilica of Constantine here um, adds the semicircular space at the end of the nave, known as the apse. Um, this standard Roman civic basilica form 
comes to be adopted by the Christian church as they are searching for uh, a form that their houses of worship might take, and sticks around in large part in architecture still today uh, as a result of that uh, adoption by um, early Christians. You see the cutaway reconstruction of the Basilica of Constantine with its large, high ceiling central nave, the apse at one end, uh, creating a, 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 a large open hall with a very high ceiling. You see the remains of the basilica as it stands um, today. The ceiling would have stood originally about 39 meters above the ground, and uh, 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 the nave measuring something like 80 by 25 meters, a very enormous cavernous space. Functional, but also uh, inspiring awe. Honorific monuments also are an important part of Roman public architecture, none more iconic than the triumphal arch. Um, there's no explicit use for an arch. It's simply a, an architectural placard, an advertisement for the accomplishments of one or more um, Roman leaders. The arch uh, develops in the Republican period, 2nd and 1st centuries BC, and continues in use throughout Roman antiquity. Here, the Arch of Constantine, uh, built between 312 and 315 AD, uh, advertises the, uh, the triumph of Constantine. Constantine, who actually fought other Romans to uh, take one-man control of the Roman Empire. And in doing this, he adopts, um, reuses, actually, sculpture of three previous emperors, Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius, creates new sculptures of his own to create a monument that sort of synchronizes uh, his own uh, uh, rule with those of other much-loved emperors of the past. And sculpture, just like the Arapakis, sculpture tells the story. The sculpture on the superstructure tells you visually all you need to know about Constantine, that he's been victorious, that he is a just, uh, legitimate, and generous ruler, and although there are written textual inscriptions, the most important messages are told without the use of words. You see here in the attic, the upper part of the arch, some of the reused sculptures. Um, here, the standing statues are captive Dacian prisoners taken from a monument of the Emperor Trajan. And the panel reliefs in the center here from a lost monument of Marcus Aurelius. Both of these showing um, the emperor emperor here, and emperor here, greeted by his uh, loyal soldiers. One of the original Constantinian uh, uh, portions of the arch is this narrow relief here, which is a scene that we call the oratio, the address, whereby Constantine, who's now headless, here he is in the center, his head has not survived, is shown in the Roman Forum, standing on the speaker's platform, flanked by seated statues of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. And all the crowd looks on, watching Constantine, the military standards stand behind him. Uh, we see him as a legitimate ruler here, giving a speech in, in the Roman Forum. So this monument, the Arch of Constantine, really serves simply to advertise a message, more so than it does to do anything else. But message-making by way of architecture is an important part of uh, the conceptualization of Roman architecture, why it exists to begin with. Um, and we will see more to do with message-making and, and art when we uh, proceed to part two of this, uh, uh, of this module and talk about Roman art uh, uh, in a little bit more detail.